Well, I guess we should just start right at the beginning. The first part is entitled Confusion is Next. Um, around the turn of the 20th century, a new crop of American writers started to reconnect to the world around them. According to this narrative of cultural healing, authors such as Jeffrey Eugenides, Jonathan Safran Foer, or Jonathan Franzen have overcome the problematic heritage of postmodernism by reinstating a reader-friendly bias in contemporary fiction via their usage of um, realist writing strategies and clearly discernible references to their audience's shared social realm of experience. And this entails the promise of a renewed political commitment of literature as well. Frenzen is a particularly curious case in this respect. First, terms like big social novel or even the much maligned moniker great American novel have frequently been flung at his breakthrough work, both by well-meaning and more mean-spirited critics, which would seem to confirm that for better or for worse, the correction's success is at least partly predicated on its reappropriation of the novel's role as a socio-political meaning-making machine. Um, these claims are usually also substantiated by reference to Frenzen's so-called Harper's essay, which is by now widely considered a manifesto that signals the return of socially conscious realist fiction. Here is where it starts to get complicated. This is Frenzen himself commenting on the immediate reception of the corrections. Interviews typically began with the question, in your Harper's essay in 1996, you promised that your third book would be a big social novel that would engage with mainstream culture and rejuvenate American literature. Do you think you've kept that promise with the corrections? To each succeeding interview, I explained that no, to the contrary, I had barely mentioned my third novel in the essay, that the notion of a promise had been invented out of thin air by an editor or a headline writer at the time, Sunday magazine, and that in fact, far from promising to write a big social novel that would bring news to the mainstream, I'd taken the essay as an opportunity to renounce that variety of ambition. In other words, a disavowal of social relevance and responsibility at the heart of the novel, not an embrace of it. However, the fact remains that there seems to be a gaping hole between authorial ambition on the one hand and the public's take on the thrust of the text itself on the other hand. If one now looks for overt discussions of political allegiances within the scholarly reception of the corrections, there is not much to be found. Um, above all, it seems to be of central concern which periodical label to stick onto post-millennial fiction as exemplified by Frenzen's output. Consequently, one can observe a proliferation of different epochal tags that alternatively make friends now to be a good postmodernist, a neorealist writer, a crackpot realist, or even a proponent of softened deliloism. Um, we might, of course, add a practitioner of post-postmodernism. Um, as the diversity and disparity of these provisional attempts at labeling makes quite clear, something more complex than a simple resurgence of realist writing seems to be taking place. Um, this might be the place where the political reasserts itself again. Um, Thomas Klawitz, for instance, poses this issue as an open question, quote, if realism as we knew it in fact transported a liberal agenda, what new agenda beside its aesthetic one, moral, political, or otherwise, may this new kind of literature offer, harbor, imply, or in fact actively transport, unquote. It seems then that the current academic debate on contemporary fiction in general and the corrections in particular is complicated by a fundamental confusion as to the actual political allegiances of the texts under the scrutiny. And in this presentation, I want to argue that these different instances of uncertainty are no accident. There is a link between the surface level ideological indeterminacy of the corrections the intuition that something political is happening within those pages, despite claims to the contrary, and the sense that there seems to be a pressing need to investigate the text's place in literary history. I will put forward the view that uh, the corrections steps onto a literary scene that is haunted by the legacy of the culture wars of the 1990s, and more specifically, it is precisely the politicized discussion of postmodernism connected to the enterprise of broadening the literary canon that has left an indelible mark on Frenzen's work. <clears throat> Part two, the culture wars loose cannons. Uh, let us then briefly have a closer look at a battlefield within the culture wars that is of importance here, the so-called cannon wars. 
Um, it is by now an established position that this conflict revolves around the question of broadening the traditional humanist canon. And depending on one's point of view, this turns it from a tool of oppression into a means of liberation by challenging the dominance of um, the by now infamous dead white males, or it contributes to a general debasement of values and intellectual standards in a misguided spirit of political correctness. This, of course, is the position taken by Harold Bloom and other scholars. Um, but how did these entrenched positions come into existence in the first place, and how can they be studied? According to actor network theory, controversies such as those flaring up during the Cannon Wars give us the unique opportunity to examine how the social is actually being assembled. Because, um, quote, groupings have constantly to be made or remade, and during this creation or recreation, the group makers leave behind many traces. They are made by the various ways and manners in which they are said to exist, unquote. This is from Bruno Latour's uh, Reassembling uh, the Social. Group formation also almost necessarily involves the element of translation, which basically means that something is added, twisted, or distorted in the process of coming together. Um, quote, translation is what happens when entities, human and non-human, come together and connect, changing one another to form links, unquote. And this is an essential feature of the emergence of social assemblages, such as those found during the culture wars. In this case, the progressive conservative divide, which in itself is already the product of translation processes in US political discourse, is associated with potentially incommensurable materials, um, the great books on the one hand or those, or those of authors from the margins. And these books are then made to align with either ideological position and are thus drawn into a fiercely polarized network of values. Canon wars then. Um, Oh, good. Um, how do these controversies relate to contemporary writing? Another look at Jonathan Franzen's Harper's essay might help to illuminate these questions. The therapeutic optimism now raging in English literature departments insists that novels can be sorted into two boxes, symptoms of disease, canonical works from the dark ages before 1950, and medicine for a happier and healthier world, the work of women and of people from non-white or non-hetero cultures. At first glance, these sharply polemical observations, of course, place Frenzen squarely in the conservative faction of um, the canon wars. However, it soon becomes apparent that uh, the true roots of his concern lie elsewhere. He takes issue with um, a view of contemporary writing that bestows an unambiguously didactic function on literature and reduces its inherent complexities in order to make its alignment with certain political positions as smooth as possible. But, as Frenzen warns, quote, the darkness of Toni Morrison's novels is not a political darkness, banishable by the enlightenment of contemporary critical theory. It's the darkness of sorrows that have no easy cure, unquote. In the parlance of actor network theory, he here insists on the incommensurability of the materials associated together in the canon wars, politics and literature, and tries to unravel this assemblage, not necessarily in the service of endorsing a conservative political agenda, but to fully embrace the internal contradictions of fiction. <clears throat> At this point, a very brief look at Linda Hutchins' A Poetics of Postmodernism might be warranted, since she has been mentioned before, and uh, since um, this is one of the most influential texts by which some of the ideas that Franzen polemically discredits have been popularized. Um, now, broadly speaking, she wants to enroll contemporary writing, and especially writing by, uh, in her words, eccentric authors, in the critique of what in Poetics of Postmodernism is varyingly referred to as liberal humanist discourse, liberal humanist notions of universality, or late capitalist bourgeois society. And thus she claims that the identity of postmodern writing is in essence determined by a, quote, new didacticism, unquote, that teaches its audience about the relativity of its dearly held humanist values. Now, this example might partly explain why Frenzen feels estranged from a vision of contemporary writing that indeed puts great emphasis on the potential usefulness of literature in social change. In addition, it illustrates why the discussion around his work centers on the question of epochal designation. 
um, there's a notable unease within this debate that might result from the lingering suspicion that something might be slightly off about the concept of postmodernism in the first place. On a more general level, this also points towards um, a blind spot in, canon, uh, in scholarly accounts of canon formation, because these usually tend to focus either on the in or exclusion of individual texts or of the, on the canon's general function, for example, in the distribution of cultural capital. Um, however, as suggested by the case of Hutchin, the schemes of literary periodization themselves regulate entry into the canon. Here it might be useful to briefly consider um, Michel Callan's um, um, concept of obligatory points of passage. Um, this is also from actor network theory, and it generally describes that the setting up of a network involves the performance of oneself or of one's central idea as an indispensable gateway into the web of interrelations one seeks to establish via first selecting certain actors and then defining their identities in accordance with one's goals. This is basically translation, what I mentioned earlier. In this sense, concepts such as realism, modernism, or postmodernism serve as focal points for the formulation of aesthetico political agendas that literature is supposed to fulfill and then turn into obligatory points of passage. You could also speak of a sort of ideological litmus test that works of fiction have to pass in order to gain entry into the canon. Hence, Frenzen's frustration also strongly indicates authorial anxiety. What if he shall not pass? Part three, the corrections. Um, by briefly having a look at the novel's depictions of academic and economic issues, I want to argue that the strategies chosen to represent these matters can be considered to be conscious attempts to undercut the kind of politically motivated co-optation so common during the canon wars. Take, for example, Chip Lambert, uh, one of the novel's protagonists who works as an adjunct professor in cultural studies. And this is him during a classroom discussion of an ad campaign entitled You Go Girl. Baudrillard might argue, Chip said, that the evil of a campaign like You Go Girl consists in the detachment of the signifier from the signified. That a woman weeping no longer just signifies sadness. It now also signifies desire office equipment. It signifies our bosses care about us deeply. <clears throat> To this, Melissa, a gifted student of his, replies, this whole class, she said, it's just bullshit every week. It's one critic after another wringing their hands about the state of criticism. Nobody can ever quite say what is wrong, but they all know it's evil. They all know that corporate is a dirty word. Here, things are getting better and better for women and people of color and gay men and lesbians, and all you can think about is some stupid lame problem with signifiers and signifieds. <clears throat> Um, these words do not leave Chip unbruised. Until his discussion with Melissa, he had taken the belief that something is indeed wrong with certain social institutions as a given, and now a disturbing thought enters his mind. If the great materialist um, order of technology and consumer appetite and medical science really was improving the lives of the formerly oppressed, then there was no longer even the most abstract utility to his criticism, unquote. Um, Thus, he loses his sense of belonging and eventually his job, and in order to survive, he's soon forced to sell his books by, among others, Habermas, Jameson, Foucault, and Greenblatt for bargain prices, both symbolically and materially selling out to the system. Um, here, analytical tools that are conventionally employed in cultural studies to systematically investigate textual artifacts are presented in a way that critically critically reflects upon their institutionalization. Rather than considering them to be objective or powerful standards of interpretation, the text depicts them relative to the social setting in which they are actually being practiced, in other words, the academic world. And this enables the text to simultaneously signal a certain degree of theoretical savviness to critics while highlighting the supposed shortcomings of these academic practices as well. At the same, at the same time, though, it marks the point of entry of such ideas into the corrections universe, which reconfirms the need to engage with such debates rather than wholesale banishing them from the fictional realm. Similar element of ambiguity can be found when having a closer look at the text's depiction of economic matters. Quote, and I just think if you knew how cool it is to start a company and how great it is when the money starts coming in and how romantic it can be, you wouldn't be so harsh, unquote, Melissa tells Chip calling attention to the personal or human level of economic interaction. 
In a later scene, the, te uh, the text skeptically depicts the radical underground scene in Philadelphia as a confused conglomerate of left-wingers for whom, quote, any crime of violence or wealth redistribution to which a cop might object could be justified as a legitimate action in a long-waging war, unquote. Nevertheless, the novel's attitude towards um, uh, transnational capitalism is more complex than these examples imply. This uh, becomes especially clear once uh, Chip leaves the safe haven of academia. His eventual emigration to Lithuania provides him with a first-hand experience of the havoc wreaked by globalization that ultimately reinforces his anti-capitalist beliefs rather than correcting them. On another equally skeptical level, the novel is concerned with the representation of globalized economy as an interrelated network of greed-driven forces which shape both American society and economies abroad. Um, the Lambert family being directly affected. Um, most central characters of the novel are quite oblivious of these developments, conveying the impression of being surrendered to a powerful network of interrelated economic forces bent on short-term profit and rationalization. Thus, the novel's very structure is shaped by various evasive maneuvers, geared at avoiding clear ideological affiliations. This way, contrary to Franzen's express wish to disengage from sociopolitics, his text paradoxically reconfirms the political agency of the novel. To put it more precisely, the debates of the culture wars are indispensable to and materially present in the pages of the novel, since the text doesn't sever its ties to the world around it, but tries to overcome the imperative that such connections need to be accompanied by the espousal of a specific political agenda. The obligatory passage point of politically engaged postmodernism is thus circumnavigated. Nonetheless, the novel's call for corrections must be understood to encompass an appeal for the emergence of a less polarized socio-political landscape as well. Coda, Frenzen and the GAN, Great American Novel. That's um, Lawrence Buell's acronym, not mine. <clears throat> um, a perspective on literary periodization that makes room for ironies and ambivalences is presently under development in the, works, in the work of Lawrence Buell on the Great American Novel. As he tries to reclaim this discredited tag from reactionary politics, um, he points out that, for example, it resides only very partially in the ivory tower of academics. It is as contradictory as the works of fiction that it seeks to describe, and it houses both inclusionary and critical approaches to questions of national and transnational identity, thus avoiding ideological simplifications. And from this perspective, Franzen's association with the term might make sense uh, since the corrections essentially tries to escape critical pigeonholing by representing political rifts as part of a whole to be reassembled. Um, from a Marxist-leaning perspective, though, the latent plural pluralist liberalism of this reappropriation might be criticized. Um, in this view, great American novels or big social novels like uh, The Corrections can be accused of glossing over necessary lines of conflict, thus effectively standing in the way of social change. Franco Moretti, for instance, claims uh, that uh, one main function of the 19th century novel, uh, historical novel was, quote, to represent internal unevenness, no doubt, and then to abolish it, a process that mixes consent and coercion, unquote. Seen thus, Frenzen's text laws in its readers with a deceptive, blurry promise of unity, um, ultimately slowing down, maybe even grinding to a halt, the long overdue radical questioning of conceptions of self and nation. <clears throat> Ironically enough, though, um, the headline Great American Novelist uh, of Time Magazine's 2010 cover story on Frenzen uh, was occasioned by the publication of Freedom, a novel that arguably actually takes clear political stances and presents rather unambiguous narratives of mischievous exploitative businessmen and the environmentally destructive impact of capitalism in mountaintop removal mining. Maybe the precarious act of hanging in the balance that the corrections tries to perform took too great a toll in the end. Maybe the reign of George W. Bush Jr. pushed even politically ambivalent writers like Frenzen to abandon their agnosticism. It remains to be seen whether the original impulse towards aesthetic and political in-betweenness, not only in his work, but also that of fellow writers like Jeffrey Eugenides or others, will prove sustainable in the end. And that was it. Thank you. <clears throat>